Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series. And you're about to hear one of my Genius Network interviews. And I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this. And I hope you find it very useful. If you want to find out more information about some of the interviews and resources that can help you in your business, you can go to www.joepolish.com. And we have a Joe Polish Recommends section with all kinds of resources and vendors and services and products that we recommend that can help you in your business. And also for more useful interviews and a whole list of other people that I've interviewed, you can go to www.geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and enjoy the interview. Hello, this is Joe Polish, president of Piranha Marketing and founder of the Genius Network interview series. And today I've got an interview that I'm looking very forward to doing because this guy is amazing. His name is uh, Tony Schwartz. This is going to be the only part of the uh, interview where I actually read something just so I make sure I get his bio down properly. And so let me tell you who this individual is. His name is Tony Schwartz, and he is the founder, president, and CEO of The Energy Project, a company that helps individuals and organizations build capacity and sustainable high performance by more efficiently managing energy. Tony has spent 30 years studying, writing about, teaching, and coaching people on how to perform at their best. Tony's most recent book, The Power of Full Engagement, Managing Energy, Not Time, is co-authored with Jim Lair, and it was the number one Wall Street Journal bestseller, spent four months on the New York Times bestseller list, and has been translated into 24 languages. In October 2007, Tony's article, Managing Energy, Not Time, The Science of Stamina, co-authored with Catherine McCarthy, was published in the Harvard Business Review. This article describes the impact of the Energy Project curriculum on engagement and performance at three Fortune 100 companies. Tony began his career as a journalist. He was a reporter for the New York Times, an associate editor at Newsweek, a staff writer at New York and Esquire magazines, and a columnist for Fast Company. He co-authored the number one worldwide bestseller, The Art of the Deal, with Donald Trump, and also wrote What Really Matters, Searching for Wisdom, in America. He also delivers keynote speeches to audiences all over the world, some very large and very recognized and respected companies. And let's see, what else do I need to say about Tony? He lives in New York City with his wife, Deborah. She's a psychoanalyst, and they have two daughters, Kate and Emily. Tony, can you hear me okay? I hear you fine. I thought you were going to say my wife was a psycho, but you finally got the rest of it out. Yeah, psychoanalyst, okay. <laughs> No, uh, speaking of, does your wife think you're a psycho with all this energy you got running around? Depends on the day. Well, hey, you also wrote a fabulous book, What Really Matters, and I read The Power of Full Engagement several years ago, uh, and I saw you recently speak at my uh, friend Eben Pagan's uh, event, Altitude, where I was also one of the speakers, and although I've read your books before and I've listened to audio from you, uh, I was absolutely blown away. Uh, I thought you were one of the most impactful speakers I've ever seen. And, and, and when I say speaker, I want to let my listeners know before we kind of get into it. I don't mean just like, oh, great motivational speaker, meaning the content of what you talked about was very powerful, very profound, and very life-changing. So I, I really appreciate you taking the time to do this Genius Network interview with me, and I, I know we'll talk about some really good stuff. So thank you. And you're in New York City right now? Right now. Perfect, perfect. Is there anything I did not say in your bio that uh, you think would be useful for the listeners to know about before I hit you with some questions on uh, No, I think you covered the uh, waterfront, Joe. Wonderful. Okay, well, let's kind of get to it then. I mean, uh, since uh, your book, The Power of Full Engagement, is kind of where it all started uh, with me in this subject matter, uh, how did you go about uh, writing this book? Well, I think what you're asking is, you know, how did I get interested in the whole issue of energy as something that we needed to pay attention to in the world of work. Exactly. Uh, yeah. And, you know, it's interesting. I, I wrote this book in the mid-90s that you mentioned called What Really Matters, Searching for Wisdom in America. And one of the people I met at that point was a, this uh, gentleman named Jim Lair, who was my co-author on the, on the Powerful Engagement. And Jim's a sports psychologist, and he had spent his career working with world-class athletes to help them figure out how to perform better under pressure. And it was really an interesting thing because the, these were people with enormous talent, enormous skill, and they would come to Jim only when, for one reason or another, their performance had broken down. And Jim began to look at what the factors were other than skill. And he had some remarkable success with a kind of who's who of athletes, helping them to get back on track and very often to perform at a level they'd never performed before, even though they were already professionals. And Jim 
and I became friends. We we really bonded over uh, the world of tennis, which is my sport and his. And we began to hang out together. And there came a point in 1999 where Jim said to me, uh, "You know, Tony, I'm I'm sick of these athletes. They're they're self-absorbed. They're they don't pay their bills, and I don't feel like I'm making enough of a difference in the world. I'd really like to take this work into another arena, like corporations. And without going through a long to-do, I had been a writer for all these years, but was ready for a pretty significant career change and was already profoundly interested in how people change and grow and meet, reach their potential. And we decided that we would partner over bringing the kind of core ideas that he'd had working with athletes into the world of organizations and businesses. And we began to do that in 1999, and really what I brought to the table was, where well, I brought a couple of things to the table. One was, because of my writing background, I had a sense of how to put this, and we'll see if you'll test this in the interview today, but how to describe the concepts in clear, simple terms that would be appealing to business people and not seem soft and spacey. The second thing I brought to it was this vast interest and accumulated knowledge about how people do change and where Jim's focus was uh, primarily on physical capacity. I had an interest in the mental dimension of this, the emotional dimension, and the spiritual dimension. And so together we started working this territory in organizations. And the culmination of our work together was the book, The Power of Full Engagement, Managing Energy, Not Time, which was published in 2003. And along with a Harvard Business Review article we wrote at the time, really put on the map this idea of managing energy versus time. What is the difference? I mean, in the book, you, you, you write energy, not time, is the fundamental currency of high performance. I mean, what exactly is the distinction? Well, well think about it, Joe. Right now, uh, anybody who's listening to this interview, um, we have their time. We have their time as long as they sit there in front of, you know, some form of technology that can get the sounds out to them. Right. But if we don't have their energy, if we don't have their engagement, what does it matter that we have their time? their time becomes irrelevant. What it's really about is how engaged is a person, not how many hours are they spending with you. And then the second piece of this energy time puzzle is that in the world we live in, and this is sort of at the heart of it, Joe, in the world we live in, time has become something that nobody has much of or any of left. Time is intrinsically finite. You know, we have 168 hours in the week, and we're never going to have another one. And the way the world operates right now, if you're an entrepreneur in particular, your dance card is already full and overflowing, and there are a ton of things that in the time you have, you already can't get done, even though you're working very, very long hours. So as a solution to the increasing demand that we all face, Time doesn't provide an answer anymore. The difference is that energy is something that is inside us and can be systematically expanded and regularly renewed. So in other words, if you can get a hold of how to manage energy, you have the potential to get more done in less time at a higher level of engagement with a better quality of life. That's not a bad promise if we can deliver on it. So... The last piece of that sort of initial puzzle around time and energy is that it turns out that if you try to understand, well, what is energy, because it's a rather amorphous concept to most people, right? You say, well, manage energy. They say, well, that's a good idea, but what do you mean? Well, it turns out energy in physics is defined as simply as the capacity to do work. So in other words, more energy equals more capacity. So if we can get a handle on how to manage energy, we'll have more capacity, a bigger reservoir to draw on, and we'll be able to do more of what we want to do without burning out and breaking down. Yeah, absolutely. Well, great. Thank you for explaining that. And, that's, uh, and, and before we get to the, well, how do you actually increase it, if you could. You, now, you mentioned uh, in your book, uh, you talked about it when uh, you were at Evan's event, uh, there's four types of energy. Uh, can you... Go through those. 
Right. So it's interesting because, you know, the first moment that you start thinking about energy, you know, you start thinking about energy in the world, and you say, well, like, a car needs energy, and a car, well, what kind of energy does a car need? Well, a car needs gas. If you put fuel into a car, that's enough energy to make the thing go, and even go at a very high level, assuming that the car is designed as a high-performance vehicle. A human being is far more complex, and we underestimate and undervalue the degree to which the needs of human beings, energy-wise, are complex. So it turns out there are four of them, Joe, as you mentioned. The first of them is the quantity of your energy. That's the core level of your energy. That's your physical energy. How much of that do you have to bring to the table? And it's composed of really just four elements. So it's fitness, how well do you transport oxygen through your body and how much strength do you have? Nutrition, how, what do you eat? When do you eat it? And how much of it do you eat? Because that determines your blood sugar level, which is the key to your energy level at the physical level. How much do you sleep and how well do you sleep? And finally, the only one of these that's at all a surprise to people is how effectively do you renew yourself or renew your energy during the day? So if you've got those four nailed, Joe, you've got it by the tail. The problem is sleep, fitness, nutrition, and rest, almost no one has all four of those nailed. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so already they're starting behind the eight ball because every other form of energy rests on the quantity of energy you have available. In other words, put it in the opposite way. If you don't have sufficient energy in the tank physically, everything else gets influenced negatively. So let me show you how that's so. So we move to the second level of energy, which is emotional energy. Now it starts to get a little bit more complex. So what is emotional energy? Emotional energy is the quality of your energy. It's how you feel, because how you feel profoundly influences how well you perform. And it turns out, interestingly, that you need to feel a certain way in order to be able to perform at your best. So let me just put it out to the people listening to this interview. Think about how you feel when you are performing at your best. What emotions come to mind? What adjectives come to your mind? Like, Joe, what comes, to, what comes to your mind when I ask you that question? I feel confident. I feel a sense of uh, joy. I feel motivated, um, just fun. So what's interesting about that is those are four of the adjectives that almost anybody you ask that question to will give. Okay. They'd be focused, engaged, passionate, but also the things you said, you know, confident, joyful, fun. All of those are the adjectives that are associated with high performance. Now, that's no news to anybody. Everybody knows that as soon as you ask them the question. What, what's news to people is that if they're not feeling that way, Joe, they can't perform at their best. In other words, any time you're not feeling motivated, engaged, passionate, focused, excited, you are suboptimal as a performer and suboptimal as a leader. So that brings you to another level of understanding, which is, well, if that's the case, that's how you have to feel, are those adjectives the adjectives you're feeling at work the vast majority of the time? Right. And most people aren't. So the whole focus of the second level of energy, emotional energy, is around how do you consciously and intentionally cultivate the quality of energy you need to perform at your best? So you've got quantity and you've got quality. Now the third level of energy is mental energy. That's the energy of focus. And that's really interesting because the more effectively you can focus, the more effectively you can do one thing at a time in an absorbed way, the more efficient and productive you become. But attention is under siege. You know, even as people are listening to this interview right now, my gut, my guess is, and my gut tells me, that they are probably doing at least one other thing and maybe two or three. They're checking their email. They may be looking at a TV screen. They may be looking at a, a, a report that they're working on. They Maybe somebody's come in and said something to them while they're listening to this. All of those things are going on. And the assumption is, Joe, that multitasking and doing multiple things at the same time or you know, in sequence serves you well in a world of infinite demand. But the reality is 
that what it results in is being partially engaged in a lot of things and fully engaged in nothing. And the consequence is that people are less efficient than they've ever been. And that's a concept called switching time. And the simple concept behind switching time is that when you shift the locus of your attention from whatever is occupying it at a given moment to a second potential focus of attention, so say you're working on something at your desk, and then you move your attention to answer an email that just came in. What happens in switching time is that the amount of time necessary to complete the first task increases by an average of 25%. So it's hugely inefficient to keep shifting your attention, and yet most of us do it all day long. So that's oh, yeah, that's how, how I spent the good portion of my, uh, my life, which is, of course, the exact reason why uh, this sort of subject and these sort of methodologies is so appealing to me and, and to so many entrepreneurs. Yeah, and, you, you know, it's interesting. Two things are interesting. One is you've probably been frustrated by that over the years. You've intuitively recognized that it's not always serving you well. And then the second thing is about entrepreneurs is I think it's intrinsic to entrepreneurs. It's, it's seductive to entrepreneurs because it's in the definition of an entrepreneur, and I, I am one, so I know what this is all about. It's in the definition of an entrepreneur that you're doing multiple jobs. That's just the way it is. You know, yeah. you're the salesperson, you're the marketing person, you're the personnel person, you are the idea person, you know, you do it all, particularly early in any given venture. And you like doing that. The problem is that you are not well served by doing it all at the same time. Exactly. <laughs> we want to have serial attention and to become deeply absorbed in whatever it is we're doing for finite periods of time and then recover and then get deeply absorbed in something else and recover. Mm -hmm. So that's three levels of energy, Joe, and feel free to come back to any of these you want to as we go along. But let me get to the last one. So the last one is the energy of the human spirit, or spiritual energy, take your choice. What the energy of the human spirit is about is the energy derived from the experience that what you're doing really matters and from an alignment between what you say is important and how you actually live your life. We know that misalignment lowers performance, right? We know it in a car. It's just as true in a human being. And we also know that when something really matters to you, you bring more energy to it, vastly more energy. So if we can help people to both clearly define what really matters to them, and that's subtler than you think, Joe, because... We are so conditioned by what we think should matter to us, by what other people say matters, that it becomes hard for a lot of us to get connected to what at the gut level really does matter to us. So, for example, I spent 25 years as a journalist, and during that period I mistook the fact that I was good at something for the fact that I was that it was something I enjoyed doing and cared about doing. In other words, being good at it became the reason I did it. And oddly enough, that's not enough. That's not enough to drive the highest level of energy in doing what you do. If you don't feel that what you're doing really matters, if that's not an active, vibrant experience you have, in each and every moment during your day, you again are losing access to a critical source of energy. Now, I have that source of energy now, and Joe, in nine years, and not all of them have been you know, great economically, but in nine years, I've never woken up a single day, no matter what was going on, not being excited to go and do what I do. That's a fabulous source of energy. So there you have it. You have quantity, quality, focus, and force. Those four sources of energy, if you've got those, if you cultivate those, if you build those, you are firing on all cylinders, and you are vastly far ahead of the game. Now, I mean, first off, uh, very, very powerful uh, insights, I think, for a lot of people. And secondly, the ability to wake up even for a week and be joyous about it would be a huge breakthrough for a lot of individuals. And, uh, you know, I loved what you what you say, and I've read this, and also 
heard you talk about it, uh, about will and discipline are highly overrated, and most of us don't have much. And, and I just thought you had such great insight on that. Please talk about that a little bit, and then I, I'm going to ask you a few more questions related to what you just talked about. That's sort of the end game of everything I've been talking about, because it's one thing for me to say, look, you've got to consciously and intentionally cultivate four different kinds of energy. It's even one more level to say, and here are the strategies for doing so in each of those four dimensions. But unless you can translate the intention you build to change a behavior, because all of these, not all of these, but most of these for most people will involve changes of behavior, unless you can find a way to bring that into your life in a way that sustains, then it's just a bunch of ideas, and who cares? Right. And, and, you know, one of the things that characterizes most really good ideas that people share is that there's not a way that functionally people can put them into practice so they really change their lives over the long term. So we, we spent a lot of time trying to understand why that was. And it's what you described that finally gave us the breakthrough, which is the recognition that we have relied on our prefrontal cortex and its unique capacities, the capacity to reflect, to make decisions, to uh, decide between different uh, possibilities about what we're going to do. Those are all the unique qualities that human beings have and no other species has. We have used that, uh, assumed that that is what, it, what we should uh, employ to make change. And the particular aspect of it we've used is what you said, namely will and discipline. So what you assume is, well, if I want to move from A to B, all I have to do is really summon up my will and discipline. But the reality turns out to be that we're not as advanced as human beings as we'd like to think, that 95% of our behaviors happen automatically every day. In other words, they're they're the response to habitual behavior, or they're a reaction to an external stimulus. Only 5% of our behaviors are consciously self-selected. In other words, we're very automatic creatures, and there's a whole field called automaticity that has begun to study this, and that's where that particular statistic comes from. And if that's the case, Joe, if only 5% of our behaviors are consciously self-selected, First of all, we're going to have to be use this small amount of will and discipline that we have very preciously. And how do we use it? We use it to create rituals that become automatic in our lives as quickly as possible. So what is a ritual? Well, a ritual is a highly specific behavior that you practice over and over and over again so that you don't have to rely on your prefrontal cortex to produce it. In other words, the counterintuitive idea here is that we need to make more use of our autonomic nervous system, of this more primitive part of our brain, to make changes. We have to co-opt the autonomic nervous system. And I want to be clear about what I mean by that. The autonomic nervous system is where behaviors become automatic, but very frequently they become habits that don't serve us well. What we want to do is we want to use that precious will and discipline to begin to launch a new behavior so it can become a habit driven by the autonomic nervous system that we don't have to think about. If you have to think about something for very long, you won't do it for very long. So a ritual, give you an example of a ritual, a ritual is I've decided I want to work out. Let me give you a perfect example. I decided I want to work out. I've been a couch potato. I'm 20 pounds overweight. I'm out of shape. I know it's hurting me. It's, now that I've listened to Tony, I realize it's the core level of energy. So not only is it critical to me physically, not only is it critical to my health, but it affects how well I think. It affects my ability to manage my emotions. It even has an impact on my motivation, my sense of uh, you know, engagement in what I'm doing. So now I decide, gosh, Tony has really motivated me around this. I've been meaning to do this for all these years. I'm going to do it. Come hell or high water, I'm going to work out three days a week from now on. 
And what do you think the odds of success are, Joe? Uh, very slim. I mean, uh, uh, for me, it's 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 very hard to say because I've been consistently working out for many years. But uh, I'd but probably you know a lot of people who don't. Oh hell yeah! I mean, I'd say you know what five percent of people maybe stick with it. I don't right, know exactly. So the person says three days a week. Their chances of success probably you know slim to none. And why? Because it isn't specific enough. Because their lives are already full of all the activities that they're already doing. So if they try to introduce a new behavior in it that requires them to think about doing it in order to get it done and to not do an activity they're already, they've already been used to, they're used to doing, the forces of, of uh, resistance are going to overwhelm it. But let's say instead you build a ritual around working out. What's the ritual? Well, the ritual is uh, to make it work. I'm going to work out from 7 to 8 on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. On Mondays and Wednesdays, I'm going to do my cardio workout. On Fridays, I'm going to do a strength training workout. And I'm actually, for the first six sessions, I'm going to hire a trainer so that I'm very clear about what my exact sequence of activities will be in weight training. So I'm going to work from 7 to 8 every morning. I'm not going to work from quarter to 7 to quarter to 8 or quarter after 7 to quarter after 8 because that will give me excuses to give it up. I'm going to do it at exact, the exact time I say I'm going to do it. And finally, if there is something that comes along that is outside my control and makes it impossible for me to do what I've committed to do, I will simply automatically default to Saturday at 7 a.m., and I will make up that missed activity as part of the ritual so that I get the three done that I commit to. Now we're talking turkey. Because if you do that with some repetitiveness, it becomes something you no longer have to think about. You feel worse when you don't do it than however bad you feel having to do it. And am I right that you don't spend a lot of conscious will and discipline working out? No, because it's become a ritual. Exactly. I mean, you know, people like you or people like me when it comes to working out know you've already built so deeply into your system the awareness of the difference between how you feel when you do and when you don't that even if you miss what is probably your regular time, and I, I will bet you probably have a pretty regular schedule on which you do this, but even if you miss it, all day long you're feeling pulled back to get it done. Oh, totally, completely. Yeah. You, you, you know what's 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 very interesting about that is that I don't really like working out. I've never been one of these people that say, "Oh, I just love working out." What I have trained myself uh, mentally in a lot of ways, and probably many other ways that you can discover that I've maybe never even thought about, uh, is that you know I don't really like working out. What I dislike more though is the consequences of not working out. And and my belief is that. You know, I've, I have a friend named Dave Kekich, and um, he's been in a wheelchair for 25 years plus, uh, paralyzed from the chest down, and he works out every single day. And he wrote these credos, and one of the lines on one of the, these credos he wrote for himself were, life's easy if you live it the hard way and hard if you live it the easy way. And although working out, you know, to me is like, yeah, it requires effort. I go into the gym and I sweat and I, you know, I exercise. Uh, but to not do that in my life is very painful. And it's, life is easier for me when I put forth that effort than if I wouldn't put forth that effort at all. And so a lot of people think, well, I don't have the time or the energy to work out. Well, to me, I would have a heck of a lot less time and a heck of a lot less energy if I didn't make that ritual. But again, it, it's not based on willpower and discipline because if I had to rely totally on that, um, you know, I'd be screwing up all the time and I'd be, you know, it, it, it just is not a good thing. Now, the, the reason that I, I brought that up and, and asked you about that is you just went through the, the four different forms of energy, physical energy, emotional energy, mental energy, and energy of the human spirit. And then you said, you know, being good is not good enough if you don't feel what you're doing matters, then you know, it, it's kind of like without a, without a purpose. And you've, you've actually laid out what is the how-to that you actually can start working out for people that don't. Well, you create a ritual. Um, do you have a way to describe how to develop a purpose if somebody doesn't have one or, yeah, you know, absolutely. any suggestions for discovering it? Yeah, absolutely. You know, what's interesting, Joe, before I answer that question specifically, let me just say that one of the things that I feel we've done that's helpful to people is to demystify some of these things, to 
recognize that every universal principle that matters is simple. If somebody has to make it complicated, then they probably haven't got to the essence of it. So the simplest principle that applies to a sense of purpose, that applies to this whole area of spiritual energy, is to shift the locus of your attention from outside yourself to inside yourself. That sounds pretty simple, but as I said earlier, we are so flooded with messages about what we should value and what we should care about and what we should think is important, that it becomes very difficult to hear the still, quiet voice inside that really contains the answer about what's meaningful to you. I think there basically are three components to clarifying your own sense of purpose. The first is to define what you are good at. So that was the thing I was saying about being a journalist. Because from an energy perspective, Joe, spending an enormous amount of energy on something that doesn't come relatively naturally to you is very inefficient. So, you know, I love to sing, but I suck at singing. <laughs> and so... I've really said to myself, that doesn't mean I'm not going to sing, but I'm not going to invest huge amounts of time and energy in my singing life because no matter how much I spend, I'm never going to be very good. So I'm not, it's, not gonna, it's never going to lead to mastery, and mastery is very satisfying. So the second thing is, the second piece of this purpose puzzle is, you do something that you deeply enjoy. So you start out at a minimum, this is something I'm naturally suited to do. That doesn't mean you do it. It just means if you don't have that, you don't make that the central focus of your life. And then the second one is, do I enjoy doing this? Does it give me a sense of satisfaction and pleasure and, and excitement to do it every day? That was what was so missing for me, you know, in some ways more than anything, in doing journalism. I just found it hard. You know, I didn't enjoy it. And so that's the second piece. And then the third piece is, um, does it give me a sense of meaning and significance? Now, you know, a lot of times when people talk about purpose, that's all they talk about. What is the meaning around it? So what I'm saying is that you need all three, and then you've got to be clear about what meaning is. So my experience and, and, and observation tells me that um, what gives people the most powerful sense of meaning is when they are doing something that connects them to something larger than themselves. That if the, if the doing that they're doing is only about their own self-aggrandizement or their own family, because your own family is pretty much the same as you individually. You're so connected to them. So if that's the sole focus of your attention, it's probably not going to deliver the charge that doing something that you think is contributing to something positively and bigger than yourself. So how do you figure that out? Well, what you do is you start observing your experience. So I'm going to say to people who are listening to this, who are still a little bit confused about that still, quiet voice inside them and what it's telling them, why don't you start to listen to it? Well, how would you do that? Well, let's say you, t you bought a little journal, and for the next week maybe the next two weeks, you walked around, you made it your purpose, you made it your focus to be aware of any situation in which you felt especially good about it or especially bad about it. Now, why do I say especially bad about it? Well, because we often learn as much from the things we despise as we do from the things we enjoy. Because when you come up against something you can't stand, Joe, tell yep. me something you can't stand. Oh, God, paperwork. Email, lots of email. Well, t tell, me, tell me a behavior that you can't stand. <laughs> like, you know, some, something somebody does that you can't stand. I do not like uh, people that do not say please or thank you and acknowledge someone. Like someone opens, uh, if you hold the door open for someone, then they don't, don't acknowledge it. Not only to myself, but when I see it done to other people or when someone's not it. nice to a waiter. I, I mean, I think you should just acknowledge people. 
I got it. So in defining what you can't stand, which is, you know, uh, rudeness, a lack of appreciation, a lack of respect, lack of respect or concern, you have revealed something you deeply stand for. And what you stand for is consideration, appreciation. Yes. That obviously is very meaningful to you. You you know the the negative energy is a is a window into what it is that you actually feel positive energy around. So that's why I say we're walking around, and what you're trying to do is to be aware of the things that you can't stand doing and the things that you revel in doing. And what you're trying to do is make a list of those things. Maybe even give it a rating from one to ten after you have such an experience. This was a this was a ten on the positive side, meaning it was you know near rapture. Um, this was a 10 on the negative side, meaning it was almost unbearable. And then what you want to do is you want to start to deconstruct. You want to start to take apart the experience you're having. So um, I just had, let's say, you know, I'm just, and this is just an example. I had an experience, let's say I had an experience today and uh, I was in a group of people and I was uh, explaining something uh, technical to them um, and they really got it, and I stepped back from it when it was over, and I said to myself, God, you know what? I loved that feeling. Now you want to ask yourself, well, what specifically was it that gave me that sense of pleasure? Did it matter that it happened in a group, or would it have been the same if I was alone? Did it matter what time of day it happened? You know, was that more meaningful or less meaningful to me? And what you begin to do is you begin to discover when you take it apart like this, the component parts of what make you come alive. And that you, you disconnect them from what the world is telling you, like make more money or get more famous or um, you know, go into this industry because it's a hot industry. Um, and you start to ask yourself the question, what actually moves me by observing your own experience? So that's the way we begin to deconstruct something like discovering purpose. I mean, very, very powerful. I mean, what, one thing I'll say about you, too, and I mean, you, I don't know if the listener would have a, 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 as deep of an understanding of this without having read any of your, your books, but you've really worked with, interviewed uh, some of what society considers some of the most successful people financially. Uh, in the world, you've seen and dealt with uh, a lot of very high-profile uh, individuals, and probably have dealt with uh, you know a lot of egos uh, along the way. And this whole one of the first things you asked me when we talked on the phone after we had first met in person was, you know, what do you want out of life? You know, when I called you up and we were we were talking, and you know, you you have a lot of insight on especially in your book, you know, what really matters, searching for wisdom in America. And, and I don't know the easy way to ask you this other than, you know, where does this drive come from? You say spiritual, uh, but I'd like you to define uh, spiritual if you could. Uh, you've already done it to a certain extent, but I'd like you to go a little bit deeper with that whole concept. And then secondly, if you could talk about you know, what you really consider a successful person, not what society says this is successful because they have this much money or because yeah. they're this famous. So if, if uh, to clarify, uh, how, how would you define spirituality? And then secondly, I'd love to hear the Tony Schwartz definition of uh, success, real success. Yeah. Boy, that, that first one, uh, the first one is, is, is a hard one. I think, you know, I'd go back to what I said earlier, which is, one of the things that's, that's, that's really clear, Joe, as we begin to deal with things like global warming and terrorism and um, other genuine threats to our continued existence that are really coming alive for people in a way they never were before, even though they were, <laughs> they've long been real threats, um, is how interdependent we are and how you can't operate anymore in a vacuum, just pursuing your own desires, whatever they may be, and your own pleasures and satisfactions without having an impact through your behaviors on other people. And I think what gives a person a sense of um, spiritual satisfaction is that 
you can wake up in the morning and say, you know, I've never thought of this before, Joe, but this is as simple a definition as I could say. I added more to the world today than I took away. I gave more than I took. And that could be in so many different ways, Joe. It doesn't mean you have to save the world and be Mother Teresa to feel spiritually fulfilled. You could do it by even something as simple as acting in accordance with the value you described to me, which is respect for other people, so that the need that people have to be acknowledged and taken seriously and seen and valued is so powerful. We all share it, that if you are a person whose behavior moment to moment, day in and day out, makes people feel better about themselves than they felt before you engaged with them, that's a potentially very powerful sense of spiritual fulfillment by itself. So if we're not in that space that I've just been talking about, boy, you've taken me up into a high realm here, but if we're not in that space of adding value, then we're subtracting value. If you're not growing, you're dying. There is no space in between those two anymore because we're too much at risk. And from the point of view of, of what your role is in the universe. So we've got to be conscious of, and this is what consciousness is really about, we've got to be conscious of the impact of what we do and then make choices that add value as opposed to subtract value or have no impact. Right, and, and you know, one thing that I think, you know, correct me if you if you think differently, our ability to add value to the world and create value to the world, I think, is in direct proportion to our ability to take care of ourselves first. And if you're completely sapped, you know, energy-wise, from all the different forms, the four forms of, of energy, then your ability to be a contributor uh, to the world is not going to be there. And I know a lot of people that use, like, intention, like, oh, my intentions are good as a cop-out. Okay, well, the, you know, the saying, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. There's, you, know, you can use that as, as fooling yourself that you're actually doing something but really not be accomplishing anything. What really matters is, is the actual act uh, absolutely. of what you do. And I really believe, I mean, you, you have said some amazing stuff. I mean, I've been taking a lot of really good notes here. Just even the line you said in the beginning, every universal principle that matters is simple. I mean, I, I love that because there's so much crap that is just regurgitated over and over about success and about what really matters. And, and, and I'm in the marketing business, and so part of the, the marketing world is this whole effort of making people feel how inadequate they are so that they'll buy this type of car or eat this type of food or whatever. And some of those inadequacies are very good to be aware of. For instance, if you're inadequate in the area of, of energy, a guy like you could completely change someone's life with just getting an understanding and awareness first. Uh, but there's a lot of forces in the world that are saying, do this, be this, think this way, that, you know, you're inadequate in all these areas, when in reality it's just a, it's a high-level form of parasitical manipulation. And, you know, I, I really believe life gives to the giver and takes from the taker and, and, you know, produce more than you consume. I mean, so what you're saying really resonates w with me a lot. Uh, what I would like to have it mean to the listeners is that I believe uh, entrepreneurs and capitalism is used in the right way is, is just a great, fabulous thing. It creates value for the world. There's a lot of hardworking entrepreneurs out there that really want to do good things and are doing good things, and they're held back uh, because of they're not taking care of themselves. They're completely mired in workaholism, and they're just overwhelmed. And yeah. you are one of these individuals that I think has an understanding that very few people I've ever met has about how to fix it and how to improve it and how to change it. And that's, you know, the reason I'm asking well, yeah, you these so, questions. So, so your, your original question was, uh, what's the relationship of taking care of oneself to being able to, to be more spiritually uh, fulfilled? Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and so the, the, the answer is that there is a very, very strong relationship. And just as I was talking about the idea that there is interdependence between us across the planet, there's also interdependence inside us among the different capacities that make it possible for us to truly be who we're capable of being. And so to value the part of you that is capable of giving 
at the expense of taking care of yourself actually subverts your ability to give. There's no question. And if you are not working all four of these dimensions, the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual, you are effectively choosing up sides, and by definition, you're less effective. So let me just give you a perfect example that came up today. I've got a few of our people out today. Just before we talked, I was talking to one of our facilitators um, who have been working with the nurses, uh, the, the intensive care nurses at the Cleveland Clinic. Now, Joe, what could be a more spirit, naturally, intrinsically, spiritually fulfilling job than helping to save people's lives who are on the verge of death? I mean, by for sure, those people have a natural purpose, and they... And to their credit, they've, they've chosen this profession despite its difficulties and its low income you know, potential because they want to make a difference. But the problem is, right to your point, is that they are so focused on taking care of other people that they take horribly inadequate care of themselves. And they think it's unimportant. And one of the things that we've gone out there and empowered them to see and believe is that they are doing not only themselves, but the people they are determined to help a great service by investing in their own you know, physical and emotional well-being. And by contrast, when they don't pay attention to those issues, their patients suffer. So we have an instinct as human beings, particularly uh, when we're operating at a low level, to choose up sides. So we say, for example, well, you know, spiritual pursuit is, 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 a, is a great and noble thing, but psychological work is, is, is meaningless. Or we say um, the way to uh, self-understanding is through body work because that's really where it all begins uh, as opposed to psychodynamic, you know, interpretive work about your life. Well, the, the answer is neither. The answer is both and a bunch of others, too. What we need to do to make the next great evolutionary leap, Joe, is to integrate the full range of capacities that are available to us and not try to choose up sides between them. And that is a giant evolutionary leap because what it requires doing is it requires accepting and living with paradox and contradiction you know, there's a great, I'm hoping I can find it while we're talking here, but there's a great quote I have from a, a, a wonderful psychologist named Jim Hillman in uh, The Power of Full Engagement about the notion of holding the opposites in life. And I, I'm going to read it to you because it's so such a powerful example of how we need sometimes to hold two completely opposite ideas in order to operated our best. So here's what he says. He says, loving oneself is no easy matter because it means loving all of oneself, including the shadow where one is inferior and feels socially so unacceptable. The care one gives to this humiliating part of oneself is the cure, but the moral dimensions can never be abandoned. Thus, the cure is a paradox requiring two incommensurables. On the one hand, the moral recognition that these parts of me are burdensome and intolerable and must change, and the loving, laughing acceptance, which takes them just as they are joyfully forever. One both tries hard and lets go, both judges harshly and joins gladly. Now that is the possibility that we haven't yet experienced, to live with, I find myself totally and completely unacceptable and therefore must change these things about myself that I can't stand. And at the same time, I completely accept the reality of where I am at this moment and live in it with a sense of love and, you know, and joy. It's a tough one. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I, you have to be an evolved uh, person in order, to, I think, to be in that, that place. But I think that's the pursuit of I, I really think that's a lot of where you've gone with uh, so much of what you've done. There's no question that this is you know I see this work as uh, the 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 opportunity to take human beings from to help human beings discover a level of of consciousness and um, 
an ability to take responsibility for themselves that represents a leap beyond where most of us are right now. Yeah, I agree, and that's you know that's one of the reasons why I love sharing your message with people. I mean, I've uh, recently I did a very large super conference. That's where I had uh, Richard Branson speak to my group and all kinds of stuff, and I talked about your book there, and I've encouraged every one of my top-level clients to read The Power of Full Engagement and go deep with this. And I actually do want you to uh, tell us about the Energy Project and what that actually does and what that stands for. Uh, I don't know how much time you have, but if you've got a few more minutes, I'd like to ask you some questions. But let's let's talk about the Energy Project and what you're actually doing now, because I think, uh, you know, there's one thing for me to do interviews on, giving people business suggestions and stuff. I think this goes much deeper into this can transform someone's life in in very positive ways. Uh, in any person that in this situation that improves their own energy level, there's a ripple effect of every human being you interact with, from your spouse to your children to your employees. And so I think the far-reaching positive impact of somebody getting this area of their life handled is is very, very uh, profound, and so you're you're a guy that I would fully endorse and recommend for anyone to go deeper with that subject. Yeah, so. We started the Energy Project with the intention of helping people build their own capacity across these four dimensions that had too little attention, and therefore were often under you know underserved and underutilized. So those are the physical, the emotional, the mental, and the spiritual. And what we did is we went into organizations and we made this case, really mostly corporations at the beginning. We made the case that if we could teach your people to build their capacity, they'd be able to manage the fierce demand they were under more successfully and more sustainably. In other words, we made it a pure economic argument. We didn't try to say to them, it's honorable and ethical to establish work-life balance at a higher level in your organization. We said... If you don't have enough capacity, you are going to see productivity lost, and if we can build that capacity, you're going to see it increase. And in addition, you're going to see people happier to be there and willing to stay for longer and work harder, or at least work more effectively. I don't want to say work harder because that immediately sounds like more hours, but work more effectively. And so that's the work we began to do. And we did it at, you know, a whole variety of really big organizations. We, we, we did it and continue to do it. Ernst & Young and uh, uh, Wachovia Bank and Sony and Dan and & Yogurt and a whole variety of large companies. And, you know, we had a wonderful experience, Joe, with the individuals with whom we worked in those organizations. Typically, they were fairly high level because it's expensive to do the depth of training that we do with them. But so, therefore, you know, the organizations were more willing to spend on their more senior executives than they were on their lower level of executives. And nonetheless, um, though we sent people off back into their worlds feeling pumped up and uh, well armed with strategies to change the way they lived they nonetheless ran back into organizations that hadn't themselves made the shift that these individuals had made. And so often there was a frustration that would, that would occur when they tried to live a principle that we taught them through a strategy we taught them in an organization that was hostile to it. So about a year and a half ago, we decided that what we would do is two things. Number one, we would no longer go into an organization where we did not have the support of the CEO and the senior executives. Because if we didn't have their support, we knew that that meant that whatever the culture was that had brought us there in the first place wasn't going to change. And the second thing we did was we said we need to work at this senior level uh, around changing the organization in terms of its policies, its practices, and its cultural messages so that they begin to make a paradigm shift, organizational paradigm shift, from what is today's reality in most organizations, namely, how do we get more out of people, to how do we invest more in people so they are motivated and capable, motivated to and capable of bringing more of themselves to work every day. And Joe, it's an incredibly, like most of this stuff, simple equation that we've presented to organizations. What we said is, if you take care of your 
people's needs more effectively, they'll take care of your needs more effectively. Yeah, totally. I mean, how complicated is that? In other words, if you free them from the need, think about this, if you free them from the need to be preoccupied with their own needs all the time because they're not being met, then they will be free to create more value for you. Yeah. So it's, a, it's called reciprocity. And reciprocity is a powerful, centuries-long principle that operates in effective relationships. So what we said was, well, what are the needs that people need to have addressed? Well, they're analogs to what, they need, what the organization needs to do are analogs to what the individual needs to do on his or her own behalf. So the first thing the organization needs to fill, the first set of needs the organization needs to fill are around sustainability. What is the organization doing to make it possible for a person to physically prosper? So what are their fitness facilities? What kind of foods are in their vending machines? What's the office environment like? What are the opportunities to rest? How are the meetings run in that organization? That's need number one, that an organization needs to become systematically focused on how to address. Need number two is self-worth, because as I was saying a few moments ago, after food and shelter, the most core need that a human being has is to be valued. And to the degree that a person does not feel valued, he or she becomes preoccupied with retrieving or asserting or, or defending his value. And that energy is not available to be used to actually create value for the organization. So what is the organization doing to treat people, back to your primary value, with respect and appreciation, because that exists in very few organizations. Then the third need that uh, organizations need to fill is the need for mastery. People have a inborn need to accomplish things and to be successful at what they do. What is the organization doing to make sure that each individual is getting the learning, is getting the opportunity, and is getting the encouragement to become effective at what they do. And then the final need that needs that organizations need to address is significance. What does the organization do to give people the genuine sense, not in the form of a value statement or a mission statement, but the genuine sense by its behavior that its employees are engaged in an enterprise that's important, that adds value rather than doesn't. There you have it on the organizational side. So what we've done in the Energy Project is we go into organizations, we work with the individuals to help them build capacity physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually, and we work with the organization to help them meet the needs of their people when it comes to sustainability, self-worth, mastery, and significance. What have you seen in terms of case studies that has happened when someone goes through this process in, a, in an organization? Well, you know, the same response you've had, Joe, is the response we get in organizations. And the reason I think you have the response you've had, you know, the positive response is not because we're geniuses. In fact, not at all because we've done something that's so amazing, but rather because we've defined very simple universal principles that anyone knows when they're put in front of them are compelling. And we've done that at the organizational level. We've done that at the individual level. So I think I used this word earlier, but we've demystified this whole process of growth, of, of leadership, of learning. We've made it very basic. And the experience at the organizational level is, you know, we in the Harvard Business Review piece, the most important thing to most organizations is the bottom line. And I'm not critical of that. I mean, without that, that's core. Without the bottom line being positive, Everything else is irrelevant, but it's not enough. And what we've done at, the, at that level is where we've had an opportunity to measure um, the impact of our work against a control group, and the most powerful place we've done that is at Wachovia Bank. Um, we've shown that we can change the profit picture of that organization quite dramatically. And anybody who wants to read the Harvard Business Review piece, just go on the HBR site, you know, can, can get a sense of that what we did there for themselves. We have, at the same time, I think, changed the 
culture of work at a number of organizations so that the experience people have is dramatically different because the organization has supported them and they've been given the skills to operate at a wholly different level than they're used to. Uh, you know, beyond not only beyond um, what it was like in the organization earlier before we showed up, but also beyond what they recognized they could do in their own lives outside of work. So we've done that at places like uh, Sony Consumer Electronics in Europe where they've really taken this whole model. We've driven it now through the top 2,000 people there. And you have an organization that's on fire. And, and it isn't a surprise that as a byproduct, Joe, not our primary goal, although we tell organizations it's our primary goal. Our primary goal is to transform organizations. But we say that we're, what we're going to do, the promise we make is we're going to affect either your profit picture, your level of engagement, your retention, your health care costs, the traditional things that organizations are willing to pay you to do. But in Sony's case, what they've got is a transformed organization. And we've begun to do that. It's most dramatic at Sony and at Wachovia, but those are where we've invested the most effort so far. There are you know, a half dozen other places where we're doing it. We're starting in uh, four weeks with the Los Angeles Police Department. I already told you that we're working with the Cleveland Clinic and therefore with, you know, cardiac care nurses and, and surgeons. We're, we're going to begin at Google in, uh, in January. So we've got very high-profile organizations, you know, with a certain progressive instinct who are recognizing that the way we're working isn't working and we need a new way of working. We need it individually and we need it organizationally. In fact, if you were going to take this at the 50,000-foot Joe, level, Joe, what you'd say is we need a world that manages energy differently at every level. Yeah, yeah. And, and the way we need to manage energy is to recognize that we've made a fatal assumption about energy. We've made it at the individual level, and we've made it at the level of the planet. I know Richard Branson is very interested in this. We've made the assumption that energy is infinite, that there's always more where that came from. And that's nonsense. And we need to recognize that the only resources that last are renewable ones. So we need to be concerned with how we renew our own energy and how we renew the energy of the planet. They're completely connected. And this can be done in very simple, concrete ways if you have a blend of awareness and a vehicle for change that is simple. You can't change anything that you're not aware of. So the first job is to wake people up to the choices they're making, but to recognize the cost-benefit ratio of every behavior they do so they can make a wise choice about whether it's worth it. And the second thing we need to do is we need to give them the, the capacity to make changes in simple ways that are actionable every day of their lives. Yeah, well, I think you do a fabulous job of uh, bringing simplicity to areas that uh, are very complex, and you're a great writer at it. You're great at speaking about it. And, and what I love, too, is, uh, you know, looking at this from my marketing hat, too, is, you, you know, you, you are selling people what they want and giving them really what they need in order to transform. I love the way that you made the distinction between what you're actually saying are the benefits and what actually happens, because I think... A lot of times people don't believe that transformation is possible because they're so mired in just the chaos and the overwhelm of it all. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, you're right, Joe. And it's so interesting. You know, I was saying to you earlier about the idea that, you know, you, you recognize often what people believe in by the fierceness of what they can't stand. And, um, you know, what's interesting is that when we go into organizations, I've learned that the people who are, are most cynical – when we go in there, are our best ultimate supporters. <laughs> and the reason is because they still have energy. They're, they, what they are is they're closet idealists. They're closet idealists because they're, they're cynical because they have such a high hope for the possible. The people who we fail with are the people who've already gone to sleep. But the people who fight with me and fight with our facilitators over the first couple of modules we do with them, God bless them. They end up being the teachers in their own organizations. <laughs> 
Yeah, and I, I, I just know from you that you can have, absolutely go toe to toe with anyone uh, that would, you know, want to say, "Oh, let's uh, well, come on, bring it, it on, bring it on." Yeah, of course. Oh, I, I mean, love it because I, it's like, thank you. You're here. You're alive. You know? No, I, I think one of the things that's a great demonstration for the value of, of what you, your expertise is and what you spent so much of your life uh, working on is, is you. I mean, when I saw you in person, you just have a persona about you. You just have a presence about you. You're filled with energy. You're passionate about what you're doing. And, and that's great because simply most people don't have that. And that's why I wanted to share some of that with, with our listeners. Do you have some time for a couple more questions? Yeah, and let me say one thing about that, which is, you know, as a human being, that quote I gave you from, from Hillman, I very much apply to myself, mm -hmm. which is to say, and, and I'm only saying this because I think it's such a good way to look at, for every one of the, the people who are listening to this, to look at their own lives. And this is the way I try to you know, go through my days, is to say, you know what, I am 110% fiercely committed to living the principles that I talk about and that I recognize are important, and I'm committed to it, and I'm passionate about it, and I'm, and I'm, do, I'm trying to do the best I can to make it come to life. And at the same time, I'm fiercely dissatisfied with how I've done, and I am never willing to accept the level I've gotten to. So I think I'm at the same time a classic violator of one principle or another at a given moment, and I'm the embodiment of some of these principles at another moment. But what never changes is it's the path I'm on. Right, right. You know, I, there's a lot of similarities in, I, in the way I would think about how I look at life and progress in the same way. I mean, one of my favorite Kekich credos from my buddy uh, Dave in the, in the wheelchair is uh, that some of the world's greatest achievers also have the highest levels of dissatisfaction. And, you know, I, I don't purposely go out of my way to figure out how to be unhappy and dissatisfied. As a matter of fact, the two things that I'm always focusing on improving in my life, entrepreneurial-wise and, and, and outside of work, is confidence and gratitude. Because I Good. think, you know, you don't do anything well in life without confidence. And uh, you uh, can have all the money in the world, all the relationships in the world, live in the nicest place in the world, the nicest country, homes, et cetera, et cetera, and have all the opportunities and resources at your fingertips but still be a miserable uh, human being if you yeah. don't have any gratitude. Well, so. what's, great, what's great about what you just said is it's such a uh, description of holding the opposites because if you think of gratitude as humility in a sense, then what you're talking about is, you know, your, your, your humility is a recognition of the fact that there are many people responsible for anything good that's going on in your life. It's not just about you. Right. And so if you think of confidence and humility, that's a classic example of opposites that you want to learn to hold. And, you know, any strength overused becomes a liability. And so what you're looking for is you're looking for something called antikaluthia, which is... Uh, it's an old Greek term that means the mutual entailment of the virtues. And it, the idea is no virtue is a virtue by itself. If you think of something like honesty, honesty, which most people would say is a virtue, honesty without compassion is cruelty. Yes. Yep. And so all virtues are entailed, which is another way of saying that um, you need to hold the opposites in any situation in, in order to see it as whole. Yeah, it's fascinating. I love it. You know, there's a, there's a book that that I read a while back called The Spirituality of Imperfection. Oh, that's great. Yeah, it, it's 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 so much. It is. It's it's really the opposites there, and I, I love that. I love talking about this. Let me let me ask you this, Tony, because I want to make sure that our listeners uh, there's the majority of the listeners of this are uh, entrepreneurs. And there are some that run very large, very successful, multi-million dollar, hundred million dollar plus uh, companies. And there's others that are mom and pop organizations that do not have a team and that are just starting out. And you really have uh, in the power of full engagement. And I do want you to give out all of your contact information for the Energy Project at the end of our uh, when we wrap up here. Uh, what I, if you could. If there's any of our listeners out there, small company, medium company, big company, and they're having a, a feeling of overwhelm and exhaustion and can't even think in their minds that it's possible to take time off or to 
work on this stuff that you're talking about here, what would be some baby step suggestions uh, for them to take? Because I, I know you've laid out such a great roadmap yeah, in your books. You. Well, the first thing would be to um, test the assumption in ways that don't uh, that aren't so threatening that you're unwilling to do it. So the assumption I'm making is that if you found a better balance between the expenditure of energy and the recovery of energy or the renewal of energy, you would be more effective, not less effective. And you may remember, I think I told this story about writing The Power of Full Engagement when we were at the event that uh, we, we met at, where um, I wrote that book under a fierce deadline. And the deadline was I had four months to write it, and I'd never written a book faster than a year. And the principle I used to be able to get it done was the understanding that human beings are designed to work no longer than 90 minutes at a time. And after that, they cannot stay at the same level of full engagement. And so I wrote it in 90-minute blocks or 90-minute sprints and then took a half-hour minimum in between each of those 90-minute sprints to renew and recover my energy. And so, in effect, from where previously I had written 12 hours a day uh, when I wrote previous books, but with a kind of medium level of focus because I was, you know, at the desk for so long continuously. Here I wrote with a 1,000% concentration for four 90-minute sections with these periods of renewal in between, and I was able to write that book in four months working half the number of hours that I ordinarily worked. So the first and most important suggestion that I give to people to test what I've been talking about today is to build true renewal breaks, even one or two, into their days. The most powerful renewal break you can take is in the afternoon, Joe, because our bodies are intrinsically designed to sleep twice, and the second time that the body wants to sleep is somewhere between 3 and 4 o'clock in the afternoon. You know, people know that from the experience of starting to feel, you know, fatigued at that point during the day. What they don't know is that their, that their output, their productivity, drops dramatically from, you know, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock on for almost all people if they're not intermittently renewing. So the first simple suggestion I give to people is create a ritual in which you have a stopping point, particularly entrepreneurs who have a little bit more control over their time. Nobody's looking over their shoulders who's a boss saying, you can't get up from your desk. The only voice that says that is their own. So 3 o'clock in the afternoon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, wherever you have that real drop, get up from your desk. Leave your desk. Go outside because the sunlight is natural there. Some de where, depending on where you live, that will be more or less true. But in any case, you will change environments. And take at least 15 minutes to fully disengage. That doesn't mean you carry your BlackBerry with you while you're doing it. It doesn't mean that you get on your cell phone. It means that you do some activity that allows you to refuel the system. You do something that allows you to get away from whatever it was you were doing because recovery is really about changing channels. And you put yourself in a position, my, one thing you might even do is when you leave, you rate the quality and quantity of your energy from 1 to 10 and you make it your purpose to come back with a higher number when you finish that renewal break than when you left. And if you don't come back with a higher number, you know you failed at renewal, which probably a lot of people will because they're not good at it until they start doing it more frequently. You know, you, me, entrepreneurs in general are terrific at spending energy and lousy at renewing energy. So it's going to take a while. Right. But what I'm, what I'm, the, 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 this first suggestion I'm making is, Give this a test run in your life. In the best of all worlds, you'll get to the point that you'll do what I do, which is you will take a break every 90 minutes throughout the day, and you will know that at the end of the day you will have been more productive than you were if you didn't do that. Okay, so that's the first. There's one other that I'm going to suggest, and only two. This is it. Because if you try to do more than one or two things, Joe, you get overwhelmed. Yes. Yeah. So the other one, and either one of these is great, but the other one that I'd suggest that I consider to be the single most powerful ritual we've ever developed to change the level of productivity in people's lives and efficiency is to do the most important thing first in the morning. So what does that mean? That means the night before, you sit down for a minute or two minutes and you ask yourself, 
tomorrow, what would be the activity that I could do that would add the most value to what I want to accomplish? Not what's the most urgent activity, which is easy to get sucked up into, and most of the people listening to this start their days by doing what, Joe? Checking email. Right. <laughs> and immediately the agenda is somebody else's instead of their own. And they're on a roll toward lots of activity and very low productivity. And so if you define the night before, and that's critical, the activity that you could get the most out of doing if you did it, the, lo- the greatest long-term value, and you make that the focus of your attention for at least the first hour and ideally the first hour and a half of your work day, you will accomplish something so significant in each of those days that it will be transformative to your work experience. It is not easy. It is so seductive to answer email. Let me just check it, and then you're off to the races. Or to answer a phone call. Or to shuffle papers on your desk. It is so powerful to during the earliest part of the day when you have the fewest distractions that are yet that are going to be in your face, when you have the highest level of energy available to you, to give yourself over to the thing that matters the most. Because we've lost prioritization in all this, too. So that's my second ritual. You define the start time. You define the stop time. You know, I have a person out in California I've been doing this with who's writing a novel, and she was stuck. And I said to her, this ritual, I said, I want you to start writing at a defined time in the morning. Okay, you tell me it's going to be 8 o'clock, that's fine. It's not 5 to 8, and it's not 5 after 8. It's 8, because then you don't cheat. And you stop at 9.30. You don't stop at 10 o'clock because you were on a run that day. The reason you don't stop at 10 o'clock is because while it worked for you that first time, you burned the system out further than you should have. You are disciplined about start time and stop time. And the other thing you get from that is that when you know you have a finish line, Joe, it's possible to fully engage. If you don't give yourself a finish line, you will necessarily be cheating on full engagement because you know that if you fully engage with no stopping point, you'd collapse at some point along the way. So the finish line gives you a way of saying, yeah, I can push because I see the end. So those are the two pieces that I would do. An afternoon break, starting with the most important thing in the morning. Wow, good stuff, good stuff. So, uh, t- Tony, thank you again. Um, how would they uh, get more information about the Energy Project and any other resources that are available for people to go yeah. deeper yeah. with what you know? Our website is theenergyproject.com. So it's theenergyproject.com. A lot of what we do is on there. They'll get a sense of, of who we are. Okay, Tony, uh, again, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to do the interview. Any uh, famous last words you'd like to share with uh, the entrepreneurs listening? My last words to this group are stay engaged, stay awake, and don't forget to get renewal. God bless. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tony. I appreciate it. All right, Joe. Hello, this is Joe Polish. I want to thank you for taking the time to listen to this interview. I hope you found it very useful. Please give me your feedback on all of the interviews that you listen to. I'd love to hear your feedback so we can always deliver a great program for you. Our website is www.joepolish.com, and we also have a Joe Polish Recommends section, so you can take a lot of the ideas and concepts that you hear on my Genius Network interview series and apply them to your business and find vendors and resources. You can go to joepolish.com to find that information and click on the Joe Polish Recommends section. And also, if you would like to find out about more interviews and invest in more useful Genius Network series interviews, go to www.joepolish.com dot geniusnetwork.com. Thanks and eat your competition alive.